All right, red light on. Welcome to Drink Beer, Think Beer, the podcast that gets to the bottom of every pint. I'm John Hall, and this is another episode recorded live before an audience, this time at Funk Fest, the great event put on by Embrace the Funk and Yazoo Brewing in Nashville, Tennessee. In just a moment, I'll be joined by Phil Wymore of Perennial Artisan Ales for a conversation about stouts, barrels, condiments, and whiskey. But first, please go visit allaboutbeer.com. There you can find original articles, reviews, news, insights, and podcasts. You can listen to shows like Brewer to Brewer and the All About Beer podcast simply by searching All About Beer wherever you listen to shows. You can also follow All About Beer on Instagram, Threads X, and Facebook at All About Beer. And to keep up with all of the smoked beer news and releases, check out This Week in Rauk Beer by searching the group on Facebook or follow at TW Rauk Beer on X, Threads, and Instagram. There's also glassware and apparel available too on allaboutbeer.com slash merch. Most importantly, this show and all of the work we do, it's supported by you. So please go visit patreon.com slash allaboutbeer. A few bucks really does go a long way to help keep content fresh and to fund writers, photographers, creators, and editors. There's even a pro level for professional breweries out there. Please give it a look. Patreon.com slash allaboutbeer. If you'd like to learn more about everything that we're doing on All About Beer, the show, advertising, beyond, just ask us the question. It's info at allaboutbeer.com. So, Funk Fest has become one of the great beer festivals in the country. And each year, Brandon Jones of Embrace the Funk and Linus Hall of Yazoo Brewing put together a thoughtful event filled with good cheer, great bottles, wonderful food, and fellowship. All About Beer is proud to be a media partner on this event. And this conversation that you're about to hear was first held last weekend, just as the fest kicked into gear and about 20 minutes after the last of a line of thunderstorms rolled through. So here's the introduction of Phil Wymore and the conversation recorded right from Funk Fest 24. All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Funk Fest 2024. You hearty souls who have braved Nashville in May weather. And now you get extra big pours because all of the wusses stayed home today. <laughs> and there's beer to be had. First off, let's just get a quick round of applause for our hosts, Linus Hall, Brandon Jones, the entire Embrace the Funk Yazoo team. If you're here, you know how special this gathering is, and they've done it year after year after year, and we are lucky to be a part of it. I'm John Hall. I'm the editor of All About Beer. I am the host of the Drink Beer, Think Beer podcast, where this will be uh, rebroadcast later on, so you can hear that at some point. And sitting right here is Phil Wymore, who I'm going to read his official bio to you right now. He is the co-founder of Perennial Artisan Ales in St. Louis, Missouri, established in 2011. And prior to opening Perennial, he spent time in Chicago as the cellar manager of Goose Island, the head brewer of Half Acre, and attended the Siebel Institute. In 2021, he started Passenger Foods, a one-person operation that makes chili crisp. And by the way, as a regular paying customer, I'm going to fully endorse Passenger Foods Chili Crisp. Uh, uh, it needs to be on everything that you're having at home. And in 2023, he co-founded Common Ritual, an independent bottler that discovers extraordinary whiskeys produced by underrepresented distilleries. Phil Wymore, everybody. That's... All right. Thanks for doing this. Oh, very kind. Thanks for the introduction. Well, you wrote it, so uh, it's... <laughs> I want to go back to 2011 when you opened and those early days of what you wanted Perennial to be. And what was the original thought? Like, because 2011 was still, I, there's maybe 4,000 breweries in the country right now. We're close to 10,000. 35, yeah, yeah 3,500. Mm -hmm. So you were still in that sort of infancy before the big rocket ship took off. Yep. What did you want the brewery to be in those early days? Yeah, so... You know, when I was at Goose Island, we, you know, I learned how to brew a, a lot of big batches of beer, um, you know, 312 Weed Ale, Honkers, mm -hmm. you know, ESB and uh, IPAs and things like that. But we had these fun little projects going on where we were, um, you know, well, 
one that was before I started there called Bourbon County Stout. Yeah, it, uh, people which have heard was of it. Yeah, relatively small at that time. Uh, we maybe had a hundred barrels of it, um, hundred whiskey barrels of it, um, and it was you know in four pack, twelve ounce bottles, collecting <laughs> dust on the shelves at Benny's. And um, those early days, there wasn't that that hype that there is now, or that that hype that there was for a while. I feel like now you can walk into Benny's and still now see dusty bottles of it. Yep. Okay. Yep. It, yeah. Exactly. Um, but those are the days too, where you could buy Cantillon on the shelves as well, and you know, uh, Happy Van Winkle, and yeah, uh, all, all kinds of uh, yummy things, you know. Um, but we started when I was there. I, I was there at a really, really great time because um, you know we had Matilda, which is sort of like a a, a nod to Orval. Uh-huh. Um, but beyond that, you know, we weren't doing at the time. Uh, at Goose Island, we weren't doing any, uh, you know, barrel age sour type beers like the, this festival, uh, you know, r- really likes to highlight. And um, so we were kind of at the genesis in, in that generation of brewers, uh, you know, where Greg Hall uh, allowed us to, to really rip on those and encouraged it and, you know, open up the budget for it. And uh, he was really inspired by, uh, you know, Rodenbach and, and another, um, you know, awesome Belgian breweries. and Things wanted that us to needed time. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and, he, and he hence really, the expense and the budget. Yeah. Exactly, and the, yeah, and the space, right? And you know, yeah, space is pretty precious in Chicago, and and Goose Island is really expanding a lot at that time too. Um, but he did, you know, allow us to uh, to to have these little experiments, you know, like Sophie and Madame Rose, and and I was uh, Madame Rose is inspired by Rodenbach, and that's something that that Greg really wanted to make, and he you know asked me to. Uh, take a run at that and uh, so that was you know, a really cool experience for me and allowed me to like you know learn something that uh, really wasn't accessible to a lot of uh, people that are getting jobs at breweries that are just churning a lot of the same stuff and I, I'm, I'm something is like fuzzing in the back of my brain right now so Madame Rose and then there's Sophie so Rodenbach Orval there's the four sisters is that mm-hmm. okay yeah. what were the other two I wish I uh, could answer that question, but you probably have to ask Greg. And this is why we don't do rehearsal. Yeah. Um, okay. But they but they were homage to actually Laffler might know. Okay. No. Juliet. Juliet. There we go. Which was an homage to what? Oh, okay, just a thing. And then who is the fourth sister? Okay. Hell yeah. All right. Thanks, John. Hey, yeah. <laughs> Laffler in the background. We have resources yeah. here. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. All you have to do is ask a question, and somebody in the crowd is going to know. And John there, Laffler usually knows. There may what he's be a few about. Forber Goose Island brewers yeah. around here. Um, all right, so I interrupted you with a question yeah. that went nowhere. So yes. yeah, so you know, I, I would say the experience of being able to work on those types of beers really led me to think about. At that time, I was thinking about starting a brewery, and hey, what if we start a brewery that really just focused on these specialty styles, and not really come out of the gate with pale ales, IPAs, brown ales, ambers, and that sort of thing. In fact, you know, we'll be so small that we, uh, we may never, you know, do, th- do anything like that. And so yeah. that was, that was the idea, uh, you know, to start perennial. Uh, and now of course I feel like a lot of breweries that started like that, they, um, you know, they diversify their portfolio and give the people what they want. And then, then you start making, uh, maybe start making a little bit of everything. Um, you know, but that came later. We, we flipped the model in the sense of just starting out specialty and then, you know, migrating towards, uh, you know, more, uh, more common styles. Okay. So in those early days, like what did you launch with, with perennial then? So if you didn't want to be that, yeah. Right. And and as, as we talked about, a lot of those beers need time. And so, you know, we started brewing stuff like that right away, uh, you know, and packing it away into barrels. Um, but, you know, we knew we had to really get out there with beer immediately and something that was, um, you know, lower ABV. So what we did was we just basically launched with um, a few, uh, you know, highly drinkable Belgian style ales. Okay. Um, so we started out with a beer called Hommel Beer, which is an homage to uh, Poppering's Hommel Beer. And then we also, uh, so, you know, basically a, a Belgo-American pale ale, um, you know, 6% ABV type of beer. And then uh, we did uh, Saison de Lis, 
which is a, uh, a Saison steeped on chamomile flowers. And it was a beer that I experimented with uh, as sort of my farewell beer at Half Acre. Okay. Um, I knew they weren't going to brew it again. And I asked Gabe and Matt there, like, hey, I might turn this into uh, sort of a flagship if you all don't mind. And uh, so we did and that. And they were like, we're all right with Daisy Cutter. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Go have fun. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, we also did a Belgian Blonde uh, called Southside Blonde. And those are still core beers for us uh, okay. to this day. Could you launch today, if you were crazy enough to open up a brewery in 2024, could you launch with those same beers, do you think? I don't think so. Um, I mean, I, I mean, you can try, but I, I, I feel You'd like... You'd like to, but yeah. yeah. I, I don't feel like it's as novel now. I, I, I mean, I can think of other breweries that started around the same time that we did that had similar ideas, like, you know, like Brewery Vivant, for instance, uh, and I'm you know, failing to remember some, some others, but, you know... It, there, other, other people had similar great ideas at the time, I think. But now, I, I, I feel like beer has shifted into a uh, give the people what they want a little bit. Um, I mean, even with the, you know these types of beers that we're celebrating here today, unfortunately, I, when I'm having conversations with brewers around the country that, that are known for that, you know, a, a lot of us are making uh, less of it than we were uh, before. Sure. Um, all right, before we go any further... Uh, our wonderful volunteers have been walking around pouring beers for folks in the crowd. Uh, what are they drinking? What did, what did you bring to special pour during this talk? So we brought two cases of uh, Vietnamese barrel-aged Abraxas. Do we have some? And uh, so this <laughs> beer differs from our uh, normal barrel-aged Abraxas. And well, one, this, this has coffee in it, Vietnamese coffee. Um, and you know, just to kind of discuss the, uh, the idea behind it, um, this, was, uh, this was brewed in collaboration with Clag Brewing, which is in Sandusky, Ohio. And uh, that is uh, the owner there, Ka Bui. Um, his, his brother, On, is uh, famously known for uh, Mekong and the Answer Brew Pub in sure. Richmond. Yep. Um, so, you know, they're both Vietnamese. And... Uh, you know, Ka wanted to uh, wanted to have a barrel aged Abraxas that had a Vietnamese spin on it, and so he selected some Vietnamese coffee uh, for us. And then, uh, rather than the the, uh, the typical uh, cinnamon that we use for barrel aged Abraxas, we use Saigon cinnamon in this, which has a stronger flavor. And then um, we also use Indonesian uh, vanilla beans in this. Couldn't find Vietnamese ones, but uh, okay. I was trying to get as close to the region as we could. So. <laughs> Um, Geographically, it's, yeah, 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 it works. Yeah, um, this is delightful. Thank this you. is. We were talking about this a little bit beforehand, and I imagine everybody's enjoying this right now. Yes, it's yeah. all right. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, <that's>... Thank <laughs> Nobody you. wants to cheer because they all have their glasses in their face as they're uh, uh, as they're drinking this right now. Um, but Abraxas is how I feel like I came to know your brewery early on. So you're making all of these everyday beers, let's call them, and in an era when everyday beers were starting to take off and everything. But you and a handful of other breweries had these big stouts, these 750s, these getting into the cool beer shops, the cool beer bars, uh, exorbitant prices that nobody blinked an eye at, at paying at the time kind of thing. You had the Goose Island background, so you knew the potential for some of these. Mm -hmm. What was the beer, what was the barrel-aged beer that sort of kicked you up to that next level? Like as, you know, 3,500 breweries when you opened, Within a couple of years, it was five, then seven, mm -hmm. and now ten kind of thing. But in that era when Abraxas was, holy shit, I have to get this. What was your first experience like realizing that you had something so, that had kicked you into that, like, that nerd culture, that, that gotta have it culture, pre-untapped just yeah. trying to get a digital badge bullshit. You know, I, w I wish we could say uh, that we planned everything by design <laughs> that, uh, you know, we're going to come out with this beer that's, you know, really going to put us on the map. But uh, that was definitely not the case. Uh, you know, I, w I was roasting squash in the, you know, the oven at, uh, in our kitchen. And, you know, we were trying to get strawberries and everything else that we could to make, you know, to add to saisons and, and, and that sort of thing. And then... Um, we decided to uh, crowdsource a little bit some ideas, and at, at that time, uh, 
you know, we had a blog uh, back when you know my fingers worked. Um, <laughs> <laughs> everybody podcasts now, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, 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 fewer strokes on the keyboard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but um, you know, we we put out to our fans, hey, you know, why don't you guys submit some ideas uh, for a beer that you'd like to see Perennial make, and uh, we'll vote on uh, the winner, and uh, you can come brew it with us. And so somebody said, hey. We'd like to see you guys make a Mexican chocolate stout, you know. And of course, at the time, you know, we we weren't pioneers in that necessarily. I mean, you know, Cigar City, uh, you know, Westbrook. Yeah, there, there Stone had done one. There's a few others that mm-hmm. were, yeah, Absolutely. like fun flavors. Yeah, that but, just work for the style too. Yeah, for sure. Um, we had a pretty talented brewer uh, working with us at that time uh, named Corey King uh, of Side Project, and uh, you know, he he wanted to take a run at He's making right. a Mexican yeah. chocolate stout, and um, you know. Our poor little mash tun, he stuffed it as full as he could um, with, with uh, you know, all the grain that he could get in there. And um, we ended up making a beer that was uh, pretty Bourbon County stout-like in the sense of uh, starting gravity. And, um, you know, and then we uh, spiced the hell out of it. You know, cinnamon, ancho chilies, uh, you know, vanilla beans, and coconut nibs. And then, um, you know, we, we served it at uh, a festival. Um, and it just blew out really quickly, and Corey was like, we got to get this into, into barrels ASAP. So we started brewing a lot of it and putting it into barrels, and uh, a, a lot not being a lot, really. We had an eight-and-a-half-barrel system. Sure. And we were uh, you know, just cranking the hell out of it. But um, you know, we, that first year, uh, we re, you know, did the barrel-aged Braxis. I, I mean, I think we might have had you know, 40 cases or something like that. It wasn't very much. We saw people starting to line up which we were not used to, and we didn't see that at Goose Island either. And uh, we, were, we, we were kind of powwowing. We're like, we, we need to put a bottle limit on this. We, we weren't even anticipating that. So on the fly, we decided to do a six-bottle limit. And then uh, <laughs> I think there was some guy in line that hired a bunch of people in the neighborhood. Oh, yeah. You know, and he ended up getting, getting Wake you know, up, Grandma! Like, yeah. Probably like, you know, 36 bottles or who, who knows, three, a few cases. And uh, then we knew we had something. But... Uh, like I said, it wasn't it wasn't really by design. It, it was really, uh, but we knew we had to react. When I think back to that era, though, and that's when I first started coming up as a beer writer, m- m- more and more. I've been doing it for you know since '03, but I, I kind of kicked in in that 10 to 13 kind of range, and uh, when I became the editor at All About the first time, and and I just remember getting a lot of these different beers into the office and tasting a lot of them. And there were a lot of people who were trying to do Mexican chocolate stouts or trying to do something barrel aged and big and boozy. And it was it was kind of sexy and exciting and and like, oh, my God, it's such and such bourbon barrel and and, and, and all of that kind of thing. But there were levels of the talent behind those beers where you could taste it in the final product. Mm -hmm. And I feel like your background Corey's background the other folks that you had working on this it wasn't just we're gonna throw this in a barrel and hope for the best no right so when you started doing barrel aged there's a whole different thought process that goes into it right I mean wood is sometimes called the fifth ingredient uh, when it's used that way Mm -hmm. and I know you're passionate about using ingredients the right way so what did you do early on with barrels that helped the beer reach its full potential? And then how has that evolved over time? So, you know, we've always brewed or we've always viewed every beer that we brew uh, as an, its own individual project. Um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, when we, when we were starting out, I feel like there was a lot of brew pubs that, you know, they use the same yeast strain for everything because it's cheaper to do that, right? And then you've got... Well, yeah, yeah we got our red ale, we got our blonde ale. Yeah, we got you order the yeah. flight, and it's a spectrum of color sitting in front of you. But and they, it's all the same house yeast. Right, yeah. right. And 1996 so, was miserable. Yeah. We spent a lot of money on yeast, um, for sure, because every beer we made, it was like, well, what would be the perfect yeast for this style of beer? One. And then... Um, you know, we decided we would spend a lot of money on ingredients too. Um, you know, any adjuncts or anything that we're doing, um, and then of course barrel is an ingredient as well, right? Sure. It, it imparts a lot of flavor. Um, you know, so for us, you know, I, I think the the thing that we've learned the most is so interesting about barrels is that you know you can buy 
a lot of barrels, uh, let's say, you know, whether it's wine barrels, which we don't know the history of as much sometimes as, as the whiskey barrels. The whiskey barrels tend to be, uh, you know, a winery might use a barrel a few times, but, uh, but uh, you know, if it's, you're buying a bourbon barrel, it's a one-use thing. Yeah. You buy it as fresh as you can. And if, let's say, you have a broker or somebody that can get you, uh, you know, 12 uh, Heaven Hill barrels, uh, Heaven Hill bourbon barrels, all from the same lot, you know, What's, what's cool about it is, you know, you rack the same beer into all 12 of those barrels and you put them in a the same temperature, you know, environment and, and, and every, keep everything as consistent as you can, but they do not develop it in the same way. You know, it, it, each one is almost like a, an organism, a, you know, a, a unique organism that, that pumps out slightly different variations and sometimes yeah. wildly different variations. Um, that, to me, has always been the most fascinating thing. And, and the thing that I enjoy the most in all of this you know i don't i don't have a lot of time to brew uh when i say it, not a lot of time to brew i don't brew anymore <laughs> unfortunately well you uh, have whiskey and chili chris that we're gonna get yeah, to but yeah yeah um, but i have uh really great brewers uh and, and i'm so fortunate that uh to, to have been associated with so many great brewers over over the time at perennial too um that uh they handle that part and um you know but what we like to do is, you know, we taste things um, as they're maturing. I uh, I do actually physically drill and and prepare the samples for for each of the uh, batches that we're uh, getting ready to blend because I, I just simply enjoy it and I want to get my hands on stuff. Um, but you know, I got to give credit to the team because we do just so much uh, by committee and voting and that sort of thing too. What are you looking for though in building out those blends, right? Because at some point. I guess in the early days, it's, wow, this tastes really good. We're going to put it out there. But now the brewery has a reputation. Now the brewery has certain expectations that you have, your team has, but then ultimately the bottle buying public has. Mm -hmm. When you're approaching that blending situation, what are you looking for in the final product? Well, and I know that's like, that's like trying to grab smoke, right? It's, yeah. Yeah, I mean... You know, as we're tasting things, there's a lot of times where, you know, one, my favorite thing in, in tasting is, is when you know that something has maybe not hit its peak, but you know that it's turned the corner. You know, if you're tasting stuff early, you're like, no, nope, it's not ready yet. You just know when, it, when, when it's ready. Um, you set all those aside, and these are, these are you know, uh, potential for blending or to en enter the blend. Um, that, that part, um, you know, for me is... Uh, is you know that that aha moment that I that I, that I love so much. Um, wait, what was? The, could you go back to the the original question though? I, I'm starting to get a little of, of what you're looking for when you're putting the final beer together. Yeah. So, like, <laughs> is there is there a DNA that only you can or only your team can put into a final blend that makes it perennial versus? I would, Even with all those outside factors. I would yeah. say that has actually shifted a bit. You know, we, we used to brew mostly the same stout. Now we have lots of different stout bases. Um, and what I'm noticing really is, you know, the public is demanding things that are uh, sweeter and that have heavier, uh, more, more full-bodied mouthfeel. And so, you know, we have to brew bigger and bigger beers to blend things. We still try to keep things probably drier than some uh, some other breweries do okay. but but for the most part you know why we, we, because it's what we like okay and so so that's what i'm trying so, to get yeah, at yeah right? exactly yeah. yeah so so there is something to that i mean and, and and there's something to that with uh even our hazy ipas you know is, is they're they're drier than a lot of other people's we don't add lactose to them uh we really want the hops to shine uh we're always trying to create some sort of a you know a base platform that will make ingredients shine <clears throat> God, it's so interesting. And so I, I'm seeing people are still drinking it. And if you need more, just raise your hand and they'll, they'll come around. Um, but that drier aspect, real, as you're saying it now, and it's the power of suggestion, right? Uh, it, it comes through. Whereas, and I think this goes back to what I'm saying in like 2013, 14, when I first started having these beers, a lot of them were overly sickly sweet. Yep. It was... Well, I'm just going to take a, a bottle of Hershey syrup and I'm just going to, you know, take the squeeze cap off and just mainline it. 
and and you know you could feel your teeth rotting out your beers never had that and that dryness yeah there's some there's something to that that mm-hmm. makes it like you want a second class without becoming you know Wilford Brimley yeah it's very funny to use the word dryness on on something that can finish around <laughs> like 15 to 20 Play-Doh even sometimes but it works right I mean are you all getting are you all who are drinking this now I'm seeing I'm seeing some heads nod right you're seeing this dryness so you're feeling this dryness as you're drinking it as opposed to that saccharine sweet rotting your teeth kind of thing yeah yeah balance is always um, the, the main thing and you know it's like even like you know, by making chili crisp or anything like that, you know, yeah. it's, it's got. It's We're gonna be, talk it's about be chili seasoned, crisp. Chill seasoned out. Yeah. perfectly, <laughs> right? And and, and, and barrel aged stouts have to be seasoned perfectly too, you know. How have the sourcing of barrels changed since those early days? Like I remember hearing stories of brewers getting barrels from di- like bourbon distilleries, and there was still two or three gallons left in. And they'd dump it out, and they'd have, you know, proof bourbon that would knock their socks off, and it was great. And these days, it's, you know, they're coming in, and maybe they're 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 wet and they're fine, but it it's not like it used to be. How 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 have barrels changed since you started using them for perennial? Well, we were pretty fortunate in the early days. Uh, I used the same uh, barrel broker that Goose Island used for a long time. His name is uh, Tom Griffin. Uh, rest in peace. Uh, oh sure. He yeah. he uh, he he was just this kind of wild man uh, driving driving around to distilleries in Kentucky and delivering barrels personally uh, all over the country. I mean, he took them to Firestone Walker. He took them to uh, you know Goose Island, and he would yeah. even swing through St. Louis and, and drop some on us too. And we really had to be on his schedule. It was uh, <laughs> it was a little tricky, <laughs> but. Um, yeah, and that's uh, like wet hop season, where it's just like, <laughs> all right, we're at the mercy of the farms, kind of thing. Yeah, it's, exactly. Uh, right, Tom's coming. We <laughs> get ready. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You had to clear your schedule because you never knew when he was going to show up. If he told you it was going to be at ten and ten in the morning, it might be uh, five in the afternoon. And he's going to stay the night at your house. So, um, but there was a charm. <laughs> there was a charm to that. That sounds like that actually happened to you. Yeah, yeah, it, it did. It okay. Did. <laughs> but um, yeah, he. Um, so you know. That, that was the easy way. Um, you know, after, after he passed on, you know, we, we, I feel like a lot of us probably use similar brokers. But, um, you know, what you do is you, you, you cozy up to the broker and you try to make as good a relationship as you can. You know, you, you got you to give them beer. You got to, you know, um, do everything that you can to uh, be in their favor because they, they have control over uh, how wet those barrels are, how fresh they are. And, uh you know, and also which ones they're going to offer you versus offering some other distillery, so or I mean other brewery rather, and so um, you know uh, that that'd be my recommendation to anybody trying to get barrels is uh, you know you got you got to cozy up to uh, the person in control. But has the quality of barrels changed? Has the because everybody's got a barrel program now. Like I walk into somebody who's been open for a minute and a half, and they're like, "Oh, here's our barrel program," and I'm like. Oh, all I, right. I feel like, like the quality is really high still. Okay. I mean, it, because whiskey's on fire. And, and, sure. and so, you know, barrels are getting dumped at, at, at such a high rate. Um, you know, I, I just I feel fortunate that, that we have all the supply for it. Um, you know, really, it's what I, I think so much of it is what, what do you do with the barrel? I, I mean, I feel like a lot of stouts out there are, are a rush to market and uh, aren't given the, the proper time in the barrel itself. Where's your time sweet spot for a barrel aged stout? You know, we're, I would say our average time now is between 18 and 24 months for Shit. most of our stuff, which means you have That's to. That's a luxury. Uh, that is. Well, you have to have space to yeah. do it for sure. Um, and, it, and you have to do it over time. You can't do it right away. And so, um, you know, we, during the pandemic, we really started socking away as much barrel aged stout as we could uh, afford to buy and uh, in terms of ingredients and holding inventory without selling it and um, you know and we're, we're sitting on uh, more th- more than we've ever had before which gives us the luxury of selecting barrels at a you know greater age and we're talking about stouts and we're here at funk fest where it's a lot of saison and mixed culture and you know really fun funky stuff 
um, uh, wild, sour, whatever you want to call it, um, those don't seem to have the same audience capture that they used to. Does, do barrel-aged stouts, are they still ruling the roost? Like, I, I feel like sometimes I get trapped in this media bubble where it's like, it's either all hazy or, hey, we're talking about loggers now. It's the year of the logger, And then somebody shows up and, no, it's the year of the Hefeweizen. And we're like, all right, go sit down. <laughs> uh, we wish that would happen. But, yeah. So is, is there, do stouts still, are they still as popular as they were, let's say, 2016? Or more so. Less I mean, so. yeah. We don't. We don't have. Uh, you know, we don't do the big lines anymore. Uh, sure. I feel like the pandemic sort of shifted that, and we, we went more to online lottery. But we're still doing. Uh, we're still finding ways to, to do the volume that we want to do. But what it's forcing us to do is to be more creative in generating more brands. And, okay. You know, to to do more styles, just to do different things. You know, we used to make maybe five barrel aged stouts in a year and uh you know we would we would we would sell them all but it was all that doesn't mean that it was more volume it was just that uh we didn't have much volume um now we're you know now we're working harder to uh you know keep the bottle limits you know reasonable reasonably low but creating more brands and, okay and, and we're getting there that way the, the, the you can get more than six now we do, we do we do something more more like twelve a year, um, yeah. but so what, grandma and grandpa can come out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, All right. there, yeah. There, we, there we go. Uh, but the shame I think in, is you know our brewers are most passionate about the beers that are being served here today. You know that that's what they really you know get up in the morning for when when they have the opportunity. You know, uh, knocking out to a cool ship or. Uh, trying different uh ingredients like the, the beer that we're serving today inside is um giant steps five which has uh 300 pounds of cold soaked uh missouri grown venals grapes and you know we have to have a relationship with a, a winery to do that and you know that's a there's a lot more love uh that goes into making a beer like that than, yeah. than a lot of the other beers that are you know more popular for us so that that, that is a shame that uh you know the demand isn't as strong as it used to be or, or where it peaked. But, um, but I'm also thankful that uh, we still have an audience and that uh, we can still make these beers. Last question on beer barrels before, or barrels for beer before I move on to other things. But how much does the provenance of a barrel matter? You know, because sometimes people are like, oh, it's a Pappy Barrel, or it's a Haven Hill, or it's a Four Roses, or it's a whatever. And we know these brands, and we're going to be like, okay, if I like that bourbon, uh, this beer is for me, because it's been aged in that. But from a brewer standpoint, how much does the whiskey that was previously held in that barrel matter at the end of the day, you're looking like, like like motherfucker. Why are you asking me this question? I think it's a yeah. great. I think it's a great <laughs> question, but it's it's a clever question too, uh, because, you know, if you if you're making, you know, I, I filled the uh, hundred Bourbon County rare uh, barrels at Goose Island, sure. uh, and uh, you know that that beer is so sought after because it went into uh, Pappy Van Winkle barrels, sure. right? Um, was that the best Bourbon County stout ever? Not likely. Um, but you know, it's there's a lot of marketing pull on, sure. on what barrels you use, and, and we like to tell people uh, what barrels we use, and we like to get our hands on the the, the, the craziest barrels we we can get. But at the end of the day, you know, it's I I think when you're putting something like a you know thirty to forty Play-Doh stout in it, you know, it's I, I think I think the provenance matters. I don't think that uh, I would rank them in, in, in the order of uh, whiskey quality to uh, what, what comes out uh, yeah. product-wise you know, for, the, for the beer itself. And there's so many variables going to that. Like, like I said, some people might get their hands on something like that, and then they might knock a stout out in uh, 10 to you know, 12 months, and it uh, would have been way better if they would have left it in there for another six months. So who yeah. knows? <clears throat> All right, so let's talk about Common Ritual then and what you're doing with that brand, that umbrella. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, I, I, yeah, and, well, I feel and, like this is the time and, for and, your and, TED Talk now. And, yeah. Well, and to, 
this. You brought chili crisp too. Yeah. Oh my god, I, I, I'm just seeing this on this the floor. We're gonna talk about for it. you. Oh god, thank you. Um, oh man. Well, I think a good way to bridge that conversation is to you know talk about um, the uh, you know the craft distilleries that, that we're working with and, yeah. and Common Ritual. I'm really excited to see what kind of stouts come out of some of those barrels because I think that you know the Common Ritual. Uh, we, you know, I started that uh, with with a couple of friends um, about six months ago, and uh, our idea was to uh, highlight underrepresented distilleries. You know, the, the distilleries that are making really awesome whiskey that I think are slept on, and um, you know, it, when when we start knocking out more of those barrels and we can put perennial stout in those, I'm I'm really excited to see what comes out of those as well. I, I figured there had to be a synergy on there, mm-hmm. but. Can you dive into a little bit, like, what is an underrepresented distillery? Like, what like, what does that, I, I kind of have an idea, but I want to hear it from you. Yeah, I think there's uh, there's a few categories here. I mean, it could be, well, they're small and, and not very well known. Um, and, and in some cases, we're working with some folks like that. Uh, there's there's also some, some distillers out there that are doing farm to glass, which I, I think is so cool. Growing, uh, say, growing all their own rye and, and making a rye with it. Um, there's also uh, distilleries that are women-led and, and led by uh, people of color, and uh, we're, we're trying to work with as, as many of those as we um, can as we sort of build the relationships and grow our portfolio too. Um, I, you know, we, we whiskey for us in, in our view has been uh, inclusive uh, somewhat over the years, and uh, you see it a lot in a lot of the marketing and, and branding. Um, you know, putting old old white bearded men on on labels or uh you know yeah. deer antlers or 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 whatever i don't know i don't well i don't know if that what that conveys necessarily but but uh we know. all like evan williams it's fine yeah. um yeah <laughs> but uh you know there's there's a lot of other folks out here that that, that are so talented and they're making they're making great stuff and, and in our view whiskey whiskey's for everybody and whiskey can be made by everybody and um you know we're we're trying to explore that angle. In some ways, it sounds like those early days of like 2011 craft beer of, you know, people trying to hit, people trying to get out there a little bit more. But then it also sounds like it's a little bit harder for whiskey brands to break out maybe in the way that you did with Perennial in those days is is that accurate yeah the i mean the shelves are certainly uh crowded you know if you go to a a a liquor store you know your your eyes glaze over a little bit looking at all the all the brands out there um another way that we are trying to differentiate is that there's if you look at the shelves and, and you really deep dive and do the research you know most of the whiskeys out there is coming, you know, coming from like six distilleries, uh, you know, dominating the shelves in terms of the labels that are out there. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that are, you know, sourcing from uh, MGP and putting their label on it. And, that, and there's sure. nothing wrong with that. But we didn't want that's our whiskey. That's the Southern Indiana facility that has a lot of bourbon that sells specialty labels to people. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Yes, exactly. And, you know, we don't want to taste like everybody else. We want... Um, a lot of variety, and, and, and in fact, that's why we're not even only working with just one craft uh, distiller. We're going to continue to work with as many as we as we feel that are doing great stuff and that represent our values, and um, you know, and and who knows where it will go in terms of branching out. But I'd love to eventually be a spot where you know we're working with you know twenty to fifty distilleries. Who knows? <clears throat> I like that. In the beer space, in the whiskey space, you have done this. You're trying to bring variety to... Yeah, there might be a... We have a mic thing going on here. Yep. Uh, there, you're trying to bring an alternative to the space. You're trying to say, okay, yeah, maybe you know... I mean, Especially with like Goose Island now, right? Uh, where Bourbon County Stout is... Uh, the media juggernaut that I get every August before the November release is just, it's this onslaught of, and here we're going to tease this out for you. And we're going to, and then it's like, okay, and these are fine beers, but I want to see what Phil is doing. I want to see what Corey is doing. I want to see what like 
smart people who have small batch barrels kind of thing. And it sounds like you're doing that with whiskey as well. And then with passenger foods, I feel like when the when the New York Times writes about, you know, is chili crisp the next condiment of the future? Or, you know, if you don't have chili crisp in your cabinet, you're doing it wrong kind of thing. And then everybody on the Upper East Side goes and starts buying kind of thing. But I've had a whole bunch. And I've had, I had yours first, I think. Um, and then I tried others and I keep buying yours because it's really good. Um, and I'm not blowing smoke, I, but I, I, there's something about the choice, but also still, it sounds like the benefit of small batch. Mm -hmm. And so from, from the view of Chili Crisp, tying it into beer and whiskey, of looking past your eyes glazing over on the shelves from the choice, looking past the big marketing budgets that international conglomerates have, and sort of putting it in the focus of what we're looking out right now at Funkfest of small brewers doing cool small things. Where does Chili Crisp, where does Passenger Foods fit into all of that? But then I guess ultimately like your entrepreneurial spirit fitting into all of that. So Brandon and I, we, we've been, uh, Brandon Jones, of, Brandon Jones yes, yeah, uh, of, of, Funk. of ETF. Yes. yes. Uh, Our host this afternoon. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we were, you know, we kind of discovered that we were, um, sort of experimenting on the side, uh, making fermented hot sauces and, um, you know, we met up. I, I think our friendship was really forged strongly, or at least reinforced over that very thing. So we we decided to uh, trade hot sauces, and then there was this little network. You know, and I know he's trading hot sauces with uh, with other uh, cool brewers around the country too. I've had some Jones hot sauce. Yeah, yeah. I don't make it, but I've had some. Yeah, yeah. and um, you know, we we're like, okay, this is the next level. You know, w w when brewers are trading beers, that's cool. But like, what else you got? You know, and uh, <laughs> and so you know, we were we were just really uh, enamored of each other's hot sauces, and so you know, there was a part of me that you know, the wheels start turning. I'm like, well, maybe I can try to package more of it because right now I'm like I'm only getting uh, I'm fermenting in these little quart jars, and I'm only getting um, uh, you know knocking out like six bottles, or, or uh, you know maybe I'll mo knock out like ten or something. It's not very scalable. Yeah, and so. Um, I started, you know, really just playing around with other things, and uh, I, I had tasted some other chili crisps, and uh, that, that to me was fascinating. I was like, well, I wonder how I can uh, see if I can make that. And so this is a pandemic project, uh, another passion project. Yeah. And, um, you know, I made about 20 versions of it, and then I, I finally had a version that I said, I'm, I think I'm ready to put that in a jar. Um, and, you know... It was really appealing too because it's way more stable than, than a lot of uh, things too because there's no water ingredients. I'm taking yeah. all dry ingredients and they're packed in oil. Um, you know, m I'm making chili oil first, of course, but yeah. Um, so you know, the the key for me in this is that it's it's kind of like my ship in a bottle. I you know I don't have any employees. I make all of it, so there's a, a lot of consistency from batch to batch because I, I take notes. I make every uh, every single batch. Uh, yeah. I make uh, four gallons at a time. I do That's it in awesome. the kitchen at Perennial uh, maybe about once a week, and it keeps me sane amidst uh, everything else because I don't have – there's nobody uh, complaining to me about uh, an issue that I have to uh, help solve or anything like that. I just get to shut everything off and, uh, and just do that, and it's deeply satisfying. I do all the deliveries myself around St. Louis as yeah. well, uh, just on my way home or on my way to work or whatever. I was legitimately surprised when I placed my last order and there was a note from you in there. Because yes. I figured, like, at this point, like, there's some intern who's just fulfilling orders. <laughs> nope. And I, 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 I was like, oh, this is really nice. And then, you know, I threw it on some eggs. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I write a personal note to anybody that I recognize that places an order okay. uh, through Passenger Foods' website. Because I do all the fulfillment, and uh, yeah, and people kind of get a kick out of that. I'll, I'll, I'll see people post on social media like the note that I wrote them on the inside of their box, and uh, yeah. I, I think it's kind of a cool thing. So, to that entrepreneurial spirit, and, I, and I'll leave it here uh, with with this on you. It's 
for a long time in the beer space, right? And in those 2011 days, it was how big can you get? And yeah. who's going to eventually buy you one day? Or are you going to pass it off to the kids? Or you're going to do all of that? I feel like what you're doing with beer, with Chili Crisp, with whiskey is staying true to those early roots of being small, being entrepreneurial, being thoughtful in what you're putting out to the world. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be people who are like, well, yeah, but don't you want to make more money? Don't you want a bigger house or an even nicer car than what you have or like whatever kind of thing? It, it, it seems to me that like you're just finding personal satisfaction through business satisfaction or business efforts by just following creativity where it speaks to you when it speaks to you. Is, is, is that true? That is, yeah, that's true. I mean, you know, I mean, I, you know, our big leap at Perennial was to uh, go from an eight and a half barrel system to a 15 barrel system, Whoa. you know, and uh, I'm, I'm glad that we were do that because we well, were able sure. to do that because yeah. we get more beer out to the world, but um, we never really had aspirations of growing into a, you know, a, a 30, 50,000 barrel a year brewery uh, and, and no uh, uh, shade to anybody that does because I'm friends with a lot of people that have done that. And I, and I, I love I was going to say, look around the room. Yeah, but anybody yeah. that's, you know, following their, their path to success is, uh, you know, we all have a different idea of what that is. Um, you know, for me, yeah, I, I'm a little whimsical, uh, you know, once I get an idea, uh, it's, it's a cool challenge to say, can I take this idea and manifest it into reality? And uh, and will it bring value to somebody? You will. It, yeah, I'm really passionate about creating things that people enjoy, uh, and you know, I'm glad that we all have the same vehicle, which is business, to uh, you know express these kinds of uh, intentions. Um, but for me, being a businessman has never meant uh, you know being fabulously wealthy or. Uh, clawing my way to the top or anything like that it's it's really uh i it puts a grin on my face when somebody uh enjoys something that that i've created or something that my team has created uh, a perennial for instance uh or enjoy something that somebody else created that i can show them uh who made it like i'm doing with common ritual whiskey is there something else on the horizon now is there something that's tickling the back of your brain that you're getting into next or are you happy with where you are right now? Yeah, not yet. I mean, Common right. Ritual is six months old. Um, right. It really needs focus and attention. And uh, I do want to grow it to uh, some level. Uh, I don't know what level that is. Um, not too concerned with that. Um, but I want to get it out to the world a little bit, uh, or my little neck of the world even. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll see. I have a feeling that it's not my last chapter. Um, but it is one that I, I need to uh, express. I like that. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for being here. Um, I have two more talks after this, and Vietnamese coffee, Abraxas, I, I feel <laughs> I might need to tap in another host for the third show at this point. I'm feeling it behind my eyes at the moment. Hey, this is Phil Wymore, everybody. Thanks so much, John. Th thanks for listening. Again, guys. my big thanks to Brandon Jones and Linus Hall at Yazoo Brewing for all they've done for beer through this festival and through their efforts every day. And I'll also point out that we're big fans of festivals with an educational component. So if you'd like to talk with us about All About Beer doing programming at your brewery's festival, pre please reach out to us. You can do that by emailing me. That's John Hall, J-O-H-N-H-O-L-L. -L, at allaboutbeard.com. That's also the email where you can get in touch with questions, comments, or guest suggestions. And a reminder, go visit allaboutbeard.com, or you can check out the podcast page, the merch page, and read great new content, as well as the archives that go all the way back to our founding in 1979. Follow All About Beer on social media at All About Beer. And if you're interested in supporting journalism in the beer space, and I hope you are, please email us at info at allaboutbeer.com to learn more or simply go to patreon.com slash allaboutbeer. As always, All About Beer has a podcast channel now. Search and subscribe on your podcast platform of choice. You can listen to shows like Brewer to Brewer and the All About Beer podcast hosted by M. Souter and Don Tess. Steal This Beer, 
nine years strong now, something like that, has new episodes every Monday. And the BYO Nano podcast comes out on the 15th of every month. And don't forget, go check out probrewer.com each week for original articles from the All About Beer team. As for this show, Mitch Weber does the music, Jeff Quinn designed our logo, and I'm John Hall. New episodes release every Wednesday, and that's when I'll be back again to drink beer and to think beer.